Good morning. This is Jose Romero, the chair of the um, uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Welcome to today's meeting of uh, the uh, Thursday, July 22nd, 2021, extraordinary uh, ACIP meeting. Uh, like any good zombie, I keep coming back. Um, so um, uh, we will take roll uh, in a minute. Dr. Cohn, do you wish to say, make any opening comments before I begin? Sure. Uh, I will make a couple of comments to open the meeting. Uh, next slide. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the July 22nd virtual meeting. Uh, copies of the slides are available for today's meeting on the ACIP website. Additionally, slides are available through the share link file link for ACIP voting liaison and ex officio members. Um, we're asking that, uh, next slide, uh, we would ask that all ACIP members mute their lines at all times until you're called on for discussion. Please raise your hand virtually. Dr. Romero will take questions first from voting, questions and comments first from voting ACIP members and then from ex officio members and liaison representatives. Um, we are not taking any votes at today's meeting. And the ACIP roster for the voting members is the same as at the last meeting. We will have a public comment session. Uh, we have both written and oral public comments uh, at today's meeting. Uh, the docket number is at the bottom of the slide. It's CDC-2001-0070. Um, you can continue to submit comments through this docket uh, written um, Additionally, the public comments that will be made today, uh, uh, these individuals have registered for public comment and they are um, they have been chosen by a random lottery to speak today. Members of ACIP, next slide, agreed to forego participation in certain activities related to vaccines during their tenure on the committee. Um, members who conduct vaccine clinical trials or serve on data safety monitoring boards are prohibited from participating in committee votes related to those vaccines. Regarding other vaccines of that company, a member may participate in the discussion but not vote. At the beginning of the ACIP meeting, when Dr. Romero takes role, the voting members only will state any conflicts of interest. And I just want to um, remind everyone that we are um, taking uh, applications for uh, the ACAP committee. Uh, the deadline to apply for the four-year term beginning July 2022 is August 1st, 2021. And thank you all who have applied so far, and uh, we look forward to any additional applications. You can go to the ACIP website um, to uh, find the online application. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Romero uh, to uh, take role today, and then we will start off with the meeting agenda. Thank you very much, Dr. Cohen. Um, okay, so um, when I call your name, um, please state your affiliation uh, for the uh, voting members and um, any um, conflicts of interest you may have. So um, I'll start. Uh, Jose Romero, I'm the Secretary of Health for the State of Arkansas and Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Um, and I have no uh, conflicts. Uh, Dr. Alt. My name is Kevin Alt, and I am a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Kansas Medical Center in Kansas City, Kansas. Welcome. Good morning. Ms. Bata. Good morning. Lynn Bata, immunization clinical consultant at the Minnesota Department of Health, and I have no conflicts. Good morning. Welcome. Dr. Bell. Dr. Bell will not be attending this meeting. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Bernstein. Good morning, this is Hank Bernstein. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, and I have no conflict. Welcome, Dr. Chen. Wilbur Chen, professor of medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and I have no conflict. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Daly. Good morning, Matt Daly. I'm a senior investigator at Kaiser Permanente, Colorado, and an associate professor in the School of Medicine at the University of Colorado, and I have no conflicts. Good morning. Welcome. Dr. Fry. 
Good morning, Sharon Fry. I am a professor of medicine at St. Louis University in St. Louis, Missouri. Thank you. No conflicts. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Cotton. Good morning, Camille Cotton. I'm the clinical director of transplant and immunocompromised host infectious disease at Massachusetts General Hospital and associate professor at Harvard Medical School. I have no conflict. Welcome, good morning. Dr. Lee. Good morning, Grace Lee, Associate Chief Medical Officer at Stanford Children's Health, Professor of Pediatrics at Stanford University School of Medicine, and I have no conflicts. Good morning. Dr. Long. Good morning, this is Sarah Long. I'm Professor of Pediatrics at Drexel University College of Medicine in Philadelphia, and I have no conflict. Welcome, good morning. Ms. McNally. Good morning, Veronica McNally, president of the Franny Strong Foundation, and I have no conflicts. Welcome, good morning. Dr. Paling. Good morning, this is Kathy Paling. I am professor of pediatrics and epidemiology and prevention at Wake Forest School of Medicine. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Alt, did you have conflicts to, dis to disclose or none to disclose? I have no conflicts, I'm sorry. I apologize for skipping that. No apologies necessary. I've done it many times, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sanchez, he may not be on the, uh, on the call at this time, but will be joining us later, but I'll call him anyway. Dr. Sanchez, are you there? All right, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Talbot. Good morning, I'm Kip Talbot. I'm an associate professor at Vanderbilt University Medical Center where I study infectious diseases and vaccines and I have no conflict. Thank you and good morning. I'll now turn to the ex officio representatives, um, starting with Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Good morning, this is Melinda Horton from uh, the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Disease. Good morning. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Okay, we'll come back. Uh, Food and Drug Administration. Good morning, Doran Fink on behalf of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration Office of Vaccines. Welcome. Human Health, uh, sorry, Health Resources and Services Administration. Good morning, this is Mary Rubin from Division of Injury Compensation Programs, HRSA. Good morning and welcome. Indian Health Service. Good morning, everyone. Uza Chukuma sitting in for Dr. Tom Weiser. I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist at the, and the brand chief for infectious uh, diseases, um, IHS National Immunization Program Manager at the Office of Public Health Support. Thank you. Welcome. National Institutes of Health. Good morning, John Bagel, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, NIH. Welcome, good morning. Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AID Policy. Oh, good morning, uh, this is David Kim, OIDT, in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Good morning. Uh, let me go back up to Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, Services. All right, we'll move on. Um, liaison representatives, beginning with uh, American Academy of Family Physicians. Good morning, Pamela Rockwell, Associate Professor of Family Medicine, University of Michigan, and the uh, Academy of Family, American Academy of Family Physicians liaison. Thanks. Thank you, welcome. Dr. Maldonado. Good morning, um, Bonnie Maldonado, Professor of Global Health and Infectious Diseases at Stanford University School of Medicine and Chair of the Committee on Infectious Diseases for the American Academy of Pediatrics. Welcome, good morning. AA, uh, sorry, American Academy of Pediatrics Red Book. Uh, this is David Kimberlin, Professor of Pediatrics, University of Alabama at Birmingham and editor of the AAP Red Book. Welcome, good morning. American Academy of Physician Assistants. Good morning, Marie Michelle Leger, American Academy of PAs, Director of Clinical Education. Welcome, good morning. American College of Health, uh, Health Association, excuse me, American College Health Association. Good morning, this is Sharon McMullen, Cornell University, also 
um, responding for my uh, co-liaison representative, Dr. Tavi Chai from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Good morning to you both and welcome. American College of Nurse Midwives. Carol Hayes, present. Good morning. American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Okay, we'll come back. Uh, American College of Physicians. Good morning, Dr. Jason Goldman, General Internal Medicine, Carl Springs, Florida, Affiliate Associate Professor at Florida Atlantic University, representing American College of Physicians. Pleasure to be here. Thank you and good morning. American Geriatric Society. Hedge Bader for AGS. Good morning. America's in Health Insurance Plans. Uh, yeah, this is Bob Gluckman, Chief Medical Officer for Robert's Health Plans. I'll be attending intermittently today, but thank you. Thank you. American Immunization Registry Association. Good morning, Aspia Diallo, representing the American Immunization Registry Association. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. American Medical Association. Uh, Sandra Freihofer, a general internal medicine physician in Atlanta, clinical adjunct associate professor of medicine at Emory, representing the American Medical Association. Good morning and welcome. American Nurses Association. Good morning, Chad Riddle, representing the ANA. Good morning, welcome. American Osteopathic Association. Good morning, Stan Grock, representing the AOA. Welcome and good morning. American Pharmacists Association. Good morning, this is Steve Foster. Good morning, welcome. Association of Immunization Managers. Hi, this is Molly Howell, Immunization Director for the North Dakota Department of Health, representing AIMS. Thank you, good morning. Association for Prevention, uh, Teaching, and Research. This is Dr. Paul McKinney. I'm Professor and Associate Dean for Research at the School of Public Health and Information Sciences, University of Louisville. Welcome and good morning. Association of State and Territorial Health Offices. Officials are you? Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Okay, we'll come back to that. Uh, Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Good morning. Welcome and good morning. Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. Uh, Christine Hahn, uh, State Epidemiologist of Idaho, representing CSTE. Thank you. Good morning. Canadian National Advisory Committee on Immunization. Good morning. It's Dr. Shelley Deeks. I'm the chair of Canada's National Advisory Committee on Immunization. Good morning and welcome. Infectious Diseases Society of America. Good morning, Jeff Duchin, Public Health, Seattle and King County and University of Washington. Thank you and good morning. International Society for Travel Medicine. National Association of County and City Health Officials. Okay, we'll come back. I just, oh, go ahead, please. Uh, Hey, good morning. This is Matt Zahn, representing NHO, present. Good morning. Welcome. National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. National Association of Nurse, of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. Okay, we'll come back. National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. Morning, Jose. This is Bill Schaffner. I'm a professor of preventive medicine and infectious diseases at Vanderbilt and the medical director of the NFID. Good morning. Welcome. National Association for Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. National Medical Association. Good morning. This is Dr. Patricia Whitley Williams, professor of pediatrics, Rutgers, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. New Jersey, uh, thank you very much. I'm representing the National Medical Association. Thank you and welcome. Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society. Good morning, Sean O'Leary representing PIDS. 
Good morning. Welcome. Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Good morning. Corey Robertson, present. Welcome. Good morning. Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine. Hi, it's Amy Middleman representing Sam. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America. Good morning. This is Marcy Dries, Chief Infection Prevention Officer and Hospital Epidemiologist at Christiana Care, representing Shay. I'll also be attending intermittently due to travel. Thank you. Thank you for that notification and welcome. Um, so we'll go back. Uh, anybody from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists? I've been informed that she's going to be late. Uh, let me go to the Association of State and Territorial Health Officers. Uh, I understand Dr. Shah is on and uh, having some technical difficulties. Uh, uh, thank you. And then um, last but not least is National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners, NAPNAP. Okay, that completes our roll call. Thank you all. Uh, Dr. Cohn, do you have anything to say or should we go move on, move on to the uh, first topic? This is Dr. Fry. Could I uh, just, uh, I forgot to um, give a conflict. I am um, the site lead for two COVID vaccine trials here at St. Louis. Sorry. Quite all right. Thank you very much for dis uh, disclosing that. Any other? Uh, Dr. Romero, I also have a message from the CMS uh, ex officio member, Mary Beth Hance, saying that she uh, is back on the meeting. She had to. Uh, uh, she had a moment where she couldn't be on. Very good. All right, so we'll, we'll move forward with our first uh, area of discussion today, which is uh, coronavirus disease 2019 vaccines with an introduction uh, by Dr. Uh, Matthew Daly. Dr. Daly, are you ready? Uh, I am. Take it away. Um, so um, it's, a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be presenting on behalf of the ACIP COVID-19 Vaccines Workgroup. Next slide, please. Um, so the graph here shows daily trends and number of COVID-19 cases in the United States that have been reported to the CDC. And after a, a heavy caseload in the winter, there's been a, a sharp decline um, with a nadir in early June, but as can be seen, um, cases have been rising lately in the last uh, number of weeks, and this current rise has been in parallel with and likely a consequence of the Delta variant. Um, to provide some additional information about vaccination, as of July 21st of 2021, um, in the United States, 339 million vaccine doses have been administered, and there are more than 161 million individuals in the United States who are fully vaccinated, and this equates to 57% of the population age 12 and older. Next slide, please. Um, so um, I, I do want to provide some introductory comments to place today's discussion in some context. Um, so I want to provide an, an overview of COVID-19 vaccine safety monitoring in the U.S. Um, it's important to um, state that COVID-19 vaccines have been monitored under the most intensive vaccine safety monitoring ever in U.S. history. And there's ongoing surveillance monitoring through multiple systems um, from six federal agencies. Um, we will hear from two of those agencies today, VAERS and VSD or Vaccine Safety Data Link. And these monitoring systems have demonstrated that hundreds of millions of people in the United States have safely received COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and I have to say that as a vaccine safety researcher myself, it, it really gives me great reassurance to know that this monitoring is ongoing on a daily basis um, and that this is independent and across multiple federal agencies. Um, next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned, we'll hear from both VAERS and VSD today. Um, VAERS is the nation's early warning system for vaccine safety. It's jointly managed by the Center for Disease Control and the Food and Drug Administration. Next slide, please. Um, this slide highlights some of the characteristics of VAERS. Again, VAERS is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. VAERS accepts all reports from anyone, regardless of the plausibility of the vaccine causing the event or the clinical seriousness of the event. 
VARES has a, a number of uh, key strengths. Um, it's able to rapidly detect potential safety problems. Um, and given its scope, it's national in scope and anyone can report, it, it really has the ability to detect rare adverse events, adverse events that are so rare that they can't be detected in uh, clinical trials. However, it's also important to highlight some of the key limitations of VARES. Um, at times, the information reported to VARES is incomplete or clinically inconsistent. VARES is also subject to reporting bias, um, over-reporting as well as under-reporting. And for these and other limitations, uh, for, excuse me, for these and other reasons, um, VARES generally can't determine cause and effect, meaning VARES can't prove that a vaccine caused a specific adverse event, um, but it can generally generate signals um, that are then investigated in other systems. Next slide, please. Um, we'll also hear today from the Vaccine Safety Data Link, or VSD. Um, the VSD is comprised of nine participating integrated healthcare organizations, which contribute data on over 12 million persons per year. The VSD is called an uh, active surveillance system, and that's an important distinction because VSD does not rely on spontaneous reporting uh, of individuals. Next slide, please. Um, so um, VSD has rich and detailed clinical data on these 12 million in individuals. This includes detailed immunization records, as well as outpatient emergency department and hospital data, um, procedure co codes, birth and death certificates. And then VSD is able to manually review electronic health records. This can be particularly useful to determine that a case was in fact a true case and that symptoms in fact started after vaccination as opposed to before. Um, so again, the VSD has uh, rich clinical data and can rapidly perform uh, manual review of electronic health records when necessary. Next slide, please. Um, so it is a reflection of this intense vaccine safety monitoring that several rare and potentially serious adverse events have been detected following COVID-19 vaccination. Um, as individuals on the call are well aware, um, there has been um, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome that has been detected after Janssen COVID-19 vaccine. And on April 23rd, um, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, ACIP, met, uh, reviewed these data and reevaluated benefit risk in the context of these new data. Next slide, please. Additionally, um, myocarditis had been detected following mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. And consequently, on June 23rd of 2021, ACIP met, they review, reviewed these new safety data, and again, reevaluated uh, benefit risk in light of this new data. Next slide, please. And then that brings us to one of today's uh, main topics, topics of discussion, which is uh, the use of COVID-19 vaccines after reports of GBS or Guillain-Barre syndrome following Janssen COVID-19 vaccination. Next slide, please. So to provide some additional context for today's conversation, I wanted to provide just a little bit of an overview about Guillain-Barre syndrome or GBS. Um, GBS is a rare neurologic disorder in which the immune system damages nerves and the uh, myelin sheaths around nerves, and this causes muscle weakness and can cause paralysis. Um, there are an estimated 3,000 to 6,000 cases of GBS reported annually in the United States, and, and typically these follow um, several different types of infectious illnesses, gastrointestinal and respiratory. And fortunately, most people do fully recover from GBS, but it's a, it's a really long and difficult recovery period. Um, but it's also important to note that some have permanent nerve damage from GBS. And when GBS occurs um, sort of at a baseline in the United States, it typically occurs in highest incidence in males and in persons over 50 years of age. Next slide, please. Um, so GBS has been reported, um, as I mentioned, um, at a higher rate uh, in the 42 days following Janssen COVID-19 vaccination. And due to this, there's been a warning added to the FDA's emergency use authorization or EUA fact sheets. The warning is as follows. Reports of adverse events following use of Janssen COVID-19 vaccine 
under emergency use authorization, suggest an increased risk of Gambray syndrome in the 42 days following um, vaccination. Next slide, please. Um, actually, just if we could go back to the prior slide, I do want to make the point that uh, GBS has not been reported following mRNA vaccines. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Um, so GBS has been reported rarely following other vaccines. It had, it had been reported following the 1976 swine influenza vaccine um, at approximately a rate of 10 GBS cases per 1 million uh, vaccine doses administered. And then um, there's been um, mixed findings in subsequent influenza seasons with some seasons uh, showing potentially a risk of GBS and others not. So, um, but uh, it's important to note that the magnitude of any potential increased risk of GBS um, following vaccination appears to be much less than the risk of actually getting GBS from natural influenza infection. Um, in addition, um, GBS cases have been reported following Zoster vaccine or Shingrix. Um, causation or causality hasn't really been established yet, but uh, there has been a warning added to the package insert um, due to this excess of approximately three to six excess cases of GBS per million doses administered in persons 65 years of age and older in the six weeks following uh, Shingrix vaccination. Um, but no increased risk of GBS had, has been observed for other vaccines. Next slide, please. So this table lists over 30 other pre-specified outcomes that are being monitored through this intensive vaccine safety surveillance. Um, next slide, please. Um, we're not going to be discussing any of these other uh, adverse events because no other safety signals will be detected, have been detected, excuse me. Um, one thing I'll note is that uh, uh, anaphylaxis, which we haven't talked about, can occur following any vaccination. Um, and that's also being monitored. Next slide, please. So um, in, this, in this slide, I wanna highlight how the ACIP responds to reports of adverse events following vaccination. Um, there is a vaccine safety technical subcommittee, which is called VAST. VAST reviews data from all of the US government vaccine safety surveillance systems, as well as data from other sources. Um, in addition to a uh, comprehensive detailed review by VAST, the COVID-19 Vaccines Workgroup also reviews these data and then puts these in the context of ben benefit risk. And then after um, review by VAST and review by the COVID Vaccines Workgroup, um, these data are then presented at a public ACIP meeting. Um, and that's what we're here to do today. And in this context, we'll review these data. We'll have a detailed discussion about benefit risk assessment and then discuss recommendations for use of COVID-19 vaccines in light of this new data. Next slide, please. Um, so I wanted to highlight some of the COVID-19 vaccine workgroup activities in the last month since we met. Um, the workgroups met weekly. Um, the workgroup has reviewed these GBS cases after Janssen COVID-19 vaccination. Um, in addition, the workgroup has uh, had detailed discussion of benefit risk balance in light of this new information. And in addition, um, the work group has reviewed and we will discuss today data and considerations for additional COVID-19 vaccine doses and immunocompromised persons. Next slide, please. And then next slide, please. So um, I wanna highlight some important clinical considerations for immunocompromised people. Um, as has been stated um, um, for many months, immunocompromised, pe immunocompromised people and their close contacts should be vaccinated against COVID-19. However, it's important to note that there have been reduced immune responses to vaccination observed in some immunocompromised people. Uh, however, even though this is true, um, it's also important to note that serologic testing to assess immune response to vaccination is not recommended for anyone, including for immunocompromised people. Um, in addition, it's important to note that immunocompromised people should be counseled to continue a number of uh, current prevention measures in addition to vaccination. These include wearing a mask and keeping socially distanced. 
and importantly, clinical guidance, guidance excuse me, for additional COVID-19 vaccine doses will be updated, um, but this is pending regulatory allowance from the FDA. Next slide, please. So that brings us to the topics for today's ACIP meeting. Um, we will have a detailed discussion around cases of GBS after Janssen COVID-19 vaccination and then discuss benefit risk balance in light of this new information. And following that, we will review the data and considerations for additional COVID-19 vaccine doses in immunocompromised persons. Next slide, please. So um, today's agenda is as follows. Dr. Meghna Alamchandani from the FDA will review GBS after Janssen COVID-19 vaccine She'll be reviewing data from the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. Following Dr. Alam Chandani's presentation, Dr. Nicola Klein from Kaiser Permanente Northern California will be presenting on behalf of the Vaccine Safety Data Link and will also present GBS data after Janssen COVID-19 vaccination. Following Dr. Klein's presentation, we'll hear from Dr. Grace Lee, who's an ACIP member as well as the VAST chair, and she'll provide a VAST assessment of these data. Following Dr. Lee's presentation, we'll have a period of public comments. Um, following the public comment, we will hear from Dr. Hannah Rosenblum, who will review COVID-19 vaccines benefit risk discussion in the context of um, this new safety information. Uh, following Dr. Rosenblum, we'll hear from Dr. Sarah Mbei from the CDC, who will discuss COVID-19 vaccines workgroup interpretation of these data and next steps. And then uh, Dr. Mbei's presentation will be followed by Dr. Sarah Oliver, who will transition to um, this additional topic of reviewing the data and considerations for additional COVID-19 vaccine doses in immunocompromised persons. Next slide, please. Um, so I'd like to express my heartfelt thanks to all of the COVID-19 vaccines workgroup members. This includes ACIP members, ex officio and government members, um, liaisons, consultants, and um, our uh, CDC lead, uh, Dr. Sarah Oliver. So thanks to all of you. Next slide, please. In addition, um, a number of CDC uh, individuals have contributed uh, tremendously to the efforts of the COVID-19 vaccines work group, and they are listed here, and I'd like to thank them all as well. Um, next slide. Okay, so that concludes my introductory comments and I'll pass it back to you, Dr. Romero. Thank you, Dr. Daly. So we'll move on to Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, after Janssen COVID-19 vaccine adverse event reporting system uh, with uh, Dr. Alam Chandani. Uh, please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Great, thanks. Um, so this is Meg Nalimchanani from FDA Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. As Dr. Daly said, we are going to be talking about the Guillain-Barre syndrome, specifically uh, data from the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. Next slide, please. Uh, so these are the topics that we will cover. Again, the focus of our discussion will be the various reports after the Janssen vaccine, as well as the recent label change that occurred last Monday, July 12th. Next slide, please. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time over this slide because Dr. Daly already went over the VAERS uh, system and the strengths and limitations. Uh, I just want to point out again that one of the key strengths is that it can rapidly detect potential safety issues, including new or rare adverse events. And one of the major limitations of a spontaneous adverse event reporting system is that you get reports with missing or inaccurate data and the reported diagnoses are not verified. I just want to keep that in mind. Next slide, please. So this slide goes over our methods to identify the preliminary reports in, uh, of GBS and bears. Uh, so to identify reports of GBS, we applied two methods. Uh, one was daily review of serious reports by an FDA medical officer, uh, as well as an automated query of the VAERS database using coded preferred terms. And the preferred terms that were used are listed at the bottom of the slide. The third bullet on this slide is, is really important and something I'm gonna repeat during the presentation. One key limitation of our analysis that I will be presenting today is that the cases have not been adjudicated to see if they meet Brighton collaboration case definitions. 
Um, the diagnosis of GBS is based on clinical features, CSF testing, nerve conduction studies, and because of the limited availability of medical records, we did not assess cases according uh, to the Brighton criteria. So that's you know something to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So as of June 30th, using the methods that were described in the previous slide, we identified 100 reports of GBS after the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine in bears. Uh, 95 of the reports were serious reports and involved hospitalizations. There was one patient who died. Next slide, please. So the next couple of slides will go over some of the characteristics of these reports. As you can see from this slide, there, this slide, there is a male predominance. 61% of the reports involved male patients. Uh, and again, as I have mentioned, we had 95 serious reports. All of the 95 reports involved patients who were hospitalized. Next slide, please. So some more uh, descriptive uh, characteristics of these reports. Um, I want to point out that the median age was 57 years. And as you can see, majority of the reports, 83%, uh, occurred in, in patients who were under 55 years of age. Uh, regarding the time to onset, the median time to onset was 13 days. And I want to uh, spend a couple of minutes talking about the risk windows. As you can see listed, the last two columns of this, uh, the last two rows have the risk windows listed. So there was a 42-day risk window that we used for our assessment and a 21-day risk window. The majority of the cases, 98%, occurred in that 42-day risk window. Uh, there were two cases that we did not include in that 42-day risk window. One occurred outside the 42 days, and there was one report for which uh, a time to onset was not specified. Uh, also, you know, if you apply the 21-day risk window, then we see that 84% cases occurred in that 21-day risk window. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next two slides, we will spend some time talking about um, a few selected case details. But again, I want to remind you that for the majority of uh, these cases, we did not have medical records, and we have very limited follow-up information available at this time and all of the work to collect that additional follow-up is ongoing, okay? Um, so of the 95 patients who were hospitalized, there were 10 patients that, who were intubated or required mechanical ventilation. Uh, there was one death. Uh, this was a 57-year-old man with a past medical history of heart failure, stroke, hypertension, and diabetes who developed pain and weakness five days post-vaccination. It was reported that he went to the hospital in an ambulance, uh, diazepam was prescribed, and he was sent home. Several days later, he developed extreme weakness and pain and returned to the hospital. He was hospitalized for 11 days, including six days on a ventilator, and he completed a course of intravenous immunoglobulin, but died 25 days after vaccination. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, we also noted that there were 24 reports that described bilateral facial paresis, and I just want to make a comment that there have been case reports in the literature of bilateral facial paresis occurring in the context of GBS that has been reported after the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, we had 12 reports that described unilateral bowel palsy. We also had a handful of reports, six reports that mentioned recent illness. Uh, there were no reports listing concomitant vaccines. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next two slides go over the observed to expected analysis that we did with these 100 reports. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through all the information that is on this slide. So the first analysis that we wanted to show you uses very broad age bands. On the left-hand side, you can see we have all ages. We have 18 through less than 65, and then 65 years of age and older. Uh, the next column goes over the observed cases. As I said, 98 cases occurred in that 42-day risk window. So this analysis is using that 42-day risk window assumption. The vaccine doses administered uh, is data that was provided from CDC. And the person years calculation, the additional details in that calculation are presented on the backup slides that go over the statistical methods. The background rate has been adjusted for uh, age relate age uh, increased incidence of GBS with increasing age, as you can see. And this is from uh, a review that was done by Search Bar. It is uh, cited at the bottom of the slide, um, looking at population incidence of GBS uh, from a meta-analysis. 
So as you can see, you know, this, uh, the background research used account for that increased incidence with increased age. Um, and then the, the last two columns. So we have expected number of cases and the rate ratio. So what, what is striking, what you can see is that the number of observed cases exceeds the number of expected cases across age groups. And we repeated these uh, calculations using different background rates. We repeated this also using the 21-day risk window. And those additional calculations are provided on the backup slide 18. Um, so the, the rate ratio is elevated, as I said, across age groups. It, it is highest in that younger age group under 65. So what we did is additional uh, OE analysis further stratifying the age groups under 65, and that's presented on the next slide. Next slide, please. So this is the, the same analysis that I showed you before. Again, you have finer uh, age bands for that under 65 age group. And what you see is that the observed cases exceed the expected cases across the age group. The rate ratio is highest around seven for the 40 to 49 year and 50 to 64 age group. Next slide, please. Okay. So as Dr. Daly pointed out, uh, the EUA fact sheets were updated on July 12th, and uh, there was a new subsection that was added under warnings and precautions for the EUA fact sheet for healthcare providers. And this says that reports of adverse events following use of the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine under EUA suggest an increased risk of GBS during 42 days following vaccination. The EUA fact sheet for recipients and caregivers were also updated. Next slide, please. So we wanted to take one minute to uh, tell you about uh, mRNA vaccines and what we are seeing in terms of a very crude comparison. So I think, you know, the big picture message for this slide is the column on the right that goes over the reporting rate per million doses administered. And as you can see from those numbers, the Janssen reporting rate is elevated and it is very different, strikingly different from the mRNA vaccine. Now, there are many limitations to this analysis. This is a very crude comparison, and I want to point out some of the caveats. Uh, this is uh, looking at all doses administered. So for the mRNA vaccines, as you know, there are two, it's a two-dose vaccine series. We're not looking at it by dose. We're just looking at cumulative all doses administered. And also, again, the number of the case counts of the various reports uh, for the mRNA vaccines, it may include duplicate reports. These were not manually reviewed. These are results of automated queries using uh, code encoded preferred terms. But even with those uh, limitations, we just wanted to display to you the reporting rate per million doses. I also want to add that we did not do additional observed to expected analysis for Moderna or Pfizer BioNTech because the, num the reporting rate is so low. The number of cases is so few, it's within the expected background rate. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, we wanted to spend one minute on the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. So the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine, as you know, is not licensed or authorized in the U.S. Uh, it, uh, it uses the chimpanzee adenoviral vector platform, and we are in close communication with our colleagues in EMA on safety updates for the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. And um, as of last month, end of, end of June, there were a total of 227 cases of GBS that had been reported to the UDRA vigilance uh, for the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. And this data was reviewed by the EMA's Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee uh, earlier this month. And they also recommended an update to the product information for the AstraZeneca vaccine to include a warning for GBS. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is my last slide to summarize uh, the information that I have presented to you. So as of June 30th, we found that there were 100 uh, reports of GDS in bears after the Janssen vaccine. Uh, as I mentioned, the observed number of reports exceeded the expected across multiple age groups without, and again, all of this analysis is without respect to Brighton collaboration criteria. That's a major limitation of our analysis. Um, we repeated these OE analysis using different background rates, and um, it was a consistent trend. It, it remained elevated. The rate ratios remained elevated. The reporting rate for GBS is higher for Janssen than for the mRNA vaccine. And as we have described on July 12th, the authorized EUA fact sheets were updated to include new information about GBS. So in terms of next steps, 
Uh, in collaboration with CDC, we will continue our work to review the follow-up information and medical records as they become available. Uh, we plan to evaluate the Janssen reports to make the determination about whether they meet the Brighton criteria. And based on the number of confirmed cases after that review and assessment, we will reassess the observed to expected analysis for GBS after Janssen. We will also continue to follow up on active surveillance studies using population-based data sources that are listed at the bottom bullet. And I think this uh, is a nice transition to the VSD presentation uh, by Dr. Nicola Klein. And that is my last slide. I think I have one more slide just listing all the reviewers. I uh, wanted to thank all the people in OBE, and um, we frequently communicate and collaborate with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, especially Dr. Shivam Bakura's group in the ISO. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, we're going to open this up to questions at this time, but they should be questions that are limited uh, to the topic at hand. So does anyone have any questions regarding uh, the VAERS? Uh, data that was presented. Let me pull up my list. Uh, we're going to start with our um, voting members. I'm not seeing any. Uh, yes, Dr. Daly, please. Um, thanks for that wonderful presentation, Dr. Alamchandani. Do, do you have a sense about what proportion of cases then um, once uh, GBS cases uh, tend to be confirmed after you've done adjudication, over. Um, so, uh, you know, we have adjudicated very few cases, you know, so far. So I wouldn't sort of uh, comment on any kind of co confirmation rate uh, at this point. I will say that our colleagues in CISA have started reviewing cases and they have looked uh, at six reports so far and they will be reviewing a few more reports. Uh, but I don't know if, you know, I know Dr. S. from CISA is on the line. I don't know if he had any more comments on that. Yeah, this is Kevin S. Um, <clears throat> I'm a neurologist at Vanderbilt University and part of CISA. We have, again, a very small number. It's currently seven cases have been reviewed so far. And of those, again, it's such a small number. But to answer your question, three of them, the committee had really good consensus that they were clearly uh, Brighton level two GBS and other ones not quite as clear. So I think it's gonna be a mixed bag, but again, we'll have to see what the um, overall case numbers look like and the data is being reviewed. Thank you for that comment. Are there any other questions from the voting members? I'll open it up then to the liaisons and ex officio members. If there are any questions, I'm not, there, uh, Dr. Paling, please. This is Kathy Paling. I wanted to follow up that question about the cases that I've reviewed. I understand that they're very small in number. Is there any distinctive characteristics that you're seeing, or are they looking like what you uh, traditional Guillain-Barre? Thank you. Yeah, again, with that same caveat, numbers are small, but the ones that were clear were pretty clearly GBS, looked like your typical GBS you get from any etiology. We are questioning about the facial weakness. It's worth uh, a little discussion about that, of Bell's palsy. Um, it's definitely reported in Guillain-Barre, and I've seen that in multiple of the patients that we've reviewed so far, so I'm very interested whether that's going to be something we see more or less of. In general, cranial nerveopathies in Guillain-Barre, specifically the facial nerve, is seen about 30 to 50% of patients, depending upon what series you look at for all comers of GBS. And our cases so far suggest maybe around there, maybe more, I don't know. But that's something that's pretty dramatic and easy to see, and I'm sure it's being reported as um, cases come up. Thank you. Any liaisons, ex officio members with questions? I'm not seeing any. So again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chandani, and we will move on then to the next presentation, which is uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome after Janssen COVID-19 vaccine, vaccine safety data link data. And this is by uh, Dr. Klein. Dr. Klein, please. Great, thank you very much and good morning. Um, so here I'm presenting, uh, we are leading the rapid cycle analysis for the COVID-19 vaccines as part of the uh, vaccine safety data link. But I'm presenting here on behalf of my team as well as 
um, both the Marshfield Research Clinic and the CDC, with whom we are collaborating very closely. This is a large team. So today, um, we will re I'll be really focusing on Guillain-Barre syndrome and what our findings today have been in the vaccine safety data link. Next slide. So just as a disclaimer, um, any mention of the products is for identification purposes and does not constitute endorsement by the CDC. Fine. So as Dr. Daly has um, pre presented so nicely, this is an overview of the vaccine safety data link. And as you can see here, there are nine integrated healthcare delivery systems that participate in the vaccine safety data link. It's a collaborative project, which has been established since 1990 and includes electronic medical health information on over 12 million individuals who are members of the individual vaccine safety data link sites. Next slide. So overall, for the VSD rapid cycle analysis, the specific aims have been to monitor the safety of COVID-19 vaccines weekly using pre-specified outcomes of interest among VSD members, and to describe the uptake of COVID-19 vaccines over time among eligible VSD members and in strata by age, site, and race ethnicity. Next slide, please. So here for the vaccine uptake, as well as the subsequent uh, data analysis, the data is as of July 10th, 2021. Next slide. So within the vaccine safety data link, we have had over 12.4 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines administered. And to date, 65.8% of the age eligible VSD population has received their first dose and 61.5% are fully vaccinated. Next slide. Now you can see here, these are um, the vaccines that have been used in the VSD sites. Um, as what is quite clear, the vast majority of vaccines that have been given are the mRNA vaccines and roughly divided between the Moderna and Pfizer, maybe a little more Pfizer vaccines, but we have given over 349,000 doses of the Janssen vaccine. And of those vaccines um, from Janssen, 40, over 44,000 have been administered to those 65 years and over. Next slide. So for the next slide, I will be showing you our prime, what we are calling our primary analyses. And this is um, what we use here is what we call the vaccinated concurrent comparisons with sequential tests. And that's quite a mouthful. But what we're actually doing is we are only evaluating vaccinated individuals and we look primarily in the 21 days after vaccination, and we compare them to other individuals who are, are, are also vaccinated, but are a little bit further away from their vaccine, last vaccine dose, and that would be between days 22 and days 42. Um, and so those are the comparators um, that we, so we're only comparing vaccinated individuals with other vaccinated individuals who are further away from their last vaccine dose. Next slide. Now, here are the outcome events, the 21-day risk interval following either dose of any mRNA vaccine. Again, we are comparing these outcome events in vaccinated individuals with vaccinated comparators on the same calendar day. So a few notes about this um, overall slide. First of all, the adjusted rate ratio. These rate ratios have been adjusted for VSC site, age group, and five-year age increments, sex, race, ethnicity, and calendar date. Um, another note is the signal, what it means to be a signal. Now, we pre-specified that in order to generate a safety signal in our uh, rapid cycle analysis, uh, we would require a one-sided p-value of less than 0.0048. And finally, the third item to point out is that we pre-specified that Guillain-Barre syndrome, as well as a number of other outcomes shown here, were, would only be included in the analysis if they were confirmed. Now, cases initially undergo a quick review for confirmation, we call it quick review for confirmation. Um, however, and, and then they get included in this analysis. However, they are subsequently removed if we, they are not confirmed after we complete a full chart review and adjudication, which um, it takes place later in time. So one of the features to um, note here that in terms of if you look at the far right column, you can see the signal that there's all no's for all the outcomes that we are following on this um, weekly basis, including the highlighted row for Guillain-Barre syndrome. You can see that the one-sided p-value of 0.828 
Um, it's much higher than 0 0.0048 and um, adjusted rate ratio is 0 0.69. Next slide. So now these are the outcome events of the 21-day risk interval after Janssen vaccine. Again, we're comparing the outcome events and the vaccinated comparators on the same calendar day. Again, comparing vaccinated individuals with a vaccinated comparators. Now, what you can see here is that again, there are no signals after Janssen vaccine for any outcomes listed. Um, for Guillain-Barre, we can see there are eight intervals, excuse me, eight cases in the risk interval for uh, GBS. But again, the rate ratio is 1.19 and the one side of PISA is 0 0.682. Next slide. So here is, I'll be reviewing the chart review summary. And this date is actually as of July, current as of July 3rd, 2021. Excellent. So the Guillain-Barre, this is Guillain-Barre following any mRNA COVID-19 vaccines chart review summary. So we initially identified 40 GBS cases and then the one to 98 days following any mRNA vaccine. So after quick review ruled out 16 of the 39 with one pending, 23 of the 39 proceeded to full review. 21 of the 23 was completed, went, underwent completed full review and adjudication um, with bright level criteria, two are pending. So from that, two adjudication confirmed 19 of the 21 as Guillain-Barre syndrome following any mRNA vaccine. And you can see um, where, when the timing was adjudicated as um, I highlighted the eight cases in the post-vaccination days, one to 21, because those are the cases um, that, contribute to the that contribute to the analysis. And you can see the, where the other cases were in the um, timing after vaccination. Next slide. So now this is the G GBS syndrome fo um, following Janssen vaccine, again, as of July 3rd. We identified 14 cases within the one to 98 days following Janssen. All 14 were quick reviewed, two ruled out, and 12 to the 14 proceeded to full review. And 10 of the 12 have completed review and adjudication with the two pending. So adjudication confirmed eight of the 10 as GBS following the Janssen vaccine. And seven of those eight were in post-vaccination days one to 21, and one was in post-vaccination days 22 to 42. Next slide. So this you, you can see this what those two last slides have been summarized actually graphically here. You can see that the, the blue bars represent mRNA vaccines and the red bars represent the Janssen vaccines. Now again, these are the chart confirmed in adjudicated cases only. And you can see where they are, where they were, um, <clears throat> how many days after vaccination when they were um, when they occurred. You can see there's also two additional mRNA cases which are not included in the graph at day 78 and 87. Next slide. Now these right here in the green bar, this, these are cases in the one to 21 days that uh, contribute to the analysis that we've been discussing. Next slide. So these are the characteristics of the, those, these cases I just showed you in the one to 21 days from the chart. And a couple um, items to note, um, after MR, the mRNA vaccines, you can see that 75% of the cases were over the age of 65. Um, versus 100% of the cases after Janssen were 18 to 64 years of age. Um, another uh, highlight, thing to highlight is in the bottom of the uh, graph is the outcome, and you can see that um, overall um, similar proportions had, were recovered with illness ongoing or had illness ongoing, although two did die after mRNA vaccine. Next slide. So here on this slide, I, I just there's a few. This is the unadjusted incidence rates of chart confirmed Guillain-Barre syndrome one to 21 days after vaccination. Now, a few caveats on this um, data: these are unadjusted incidence rates. They are not so they are not adjusted for age, sex, race, or VSD site. And the other thing to point out is that the, our study was never designed to do a head-to-head -head um, comparison of mRNA versus Janssen vaccine. Um, however, that being said. You can see after mRNA vaccines, there were the eight confirmed cases, the one to 21 day interval. You can see that uh, there's just over 11.7 million doses and corresponding number of person years. So what that, what that translates to is a 
unadjusted rate per million doses of 0.7 with associated confidence intervals, and an unadjusted rate per 100,000 person years of 1.2 with uh, associated confidence interval. Um, in comparison, there's the Janssen vaccine, which has seven cases confirmed in the 1 to 21 day risk interval um, out of 345,000 doses. Um, and for an, un an unadjusted rate per million doses of 20.2 with associated confidence intervals and an unadjusted rate per 100,000 person years of 35.2. Next slide. So in summary, um, GBS and the VSD after COVID-19 vaccinations. The VSD has not identified a signal for any outcome in the primary analyses, including GBS, after mRNA or Janssen vaccines. And analyses do not include a head-to-head -head comparison of Janssen with mRNA vaccines. However, the chart confirmed unadjusted instance rates of GBS during the 21 days after the Janssen vaccine is much higher than during the 21 days after the mRNA vaccine. A weekly uptake of Janssen in the VSD has been minimal uh, in the range of 2,500 to 11,000 doses a week. And uh, we strongly believe that continued VSD monitoring of GBS is warranted. And we will continue to chart review every case of GBS within the one to 98 days following any COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. So I just want to acknowledge I am, as I mentioned, presenting here on the behalf of a large team who have been working very, very hard for the last seven months on many outcomes. In particular, I really want to thank uh, from my team, Ned Lewis, Bruce Fireman, Kristen Goddard, and also Nan Bakshi, who's our neurologist. And then also from Marshall uh, Clinic, uh, Kayla Hansen, who's been really leading these GBS case reviews, as well as the CDC Immunization Safety Office and all of our DSD partner sites. It's been so wonderful about doing our low chart review so quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Klein. Um, we're going to open this up for questions at this time again, focusing only on the, what was presented here uh, on the VSD data, please. Let me pull up my list. Uh, Dr. Paling, your hand is up. Um, yes, Dr. Klein, thank you for this great um, presentation, um, very informative. One of the questions that I had is in the cases of um, Guillain-Barre, it was detected in the um, VSD, um, what was the geographic distribution? And also, uh, do you have any race ethnicity information? Uh, I do not know offhand what the geographic location of which sites um, the cases were. Um, I know that um, our analyses are just for BSD sites, but I don't know, I know which case, which um, sites had the cases. Um, and the analysis again are adjusted for race and ethnicity. Um, we do have race and ethnicity from the chart views. I'm afraid I don't have that available offhand. Thank you. Anyone else from the voting membership that would like to ask a question? Let me turn to the uh, liaisons. Not seeing any. Any ex officio members? Okay, I think that's it. Oh, excuse me, uh, Dr. McKinney. Yes, I wonder if it's possible to determine whether um, any of the uh, GBS uh, cases had been co-immunized with any other vaccine products during the 21 days prior to onset of symptoms? Uh, yes, that certainly is possible. We do have that data. Again, I apologize. I don't have that data available, but that is data that we can readily access and um, get. Thank you, Dr. Paling. I've got one more question. Do you have any data on the severity of these cases? in this database, how many were in the ICU or intubated? So we have some, some outcome data, as I think I showed you in the slide, but um, we are in the process of um, updating our chart review form to get a little more outcome data and a little more clinical information um, for the, the cases that have, uh, we have evaluated to date. Um, I can tell you, actually, you know, I, I'm sorry, I apologize. Can you go to the backup slide number 26? I do have some additional information on there.
So uh, these are additional characteristics from the chart review um, in terms of the treatment that there was uh, one that was intubated um, from the ants and none after the mRNA vaccines. And uh, you can see in terms of the other treatments, what was done. What was done. Any other questions? Dr. McKinney, your hand is still up. I just want to make sure that you're, you don't have another question to ask. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else? Oh, can, I'm sorry. Can I also point out that um, I, I misspoke before that we do have the concomitant vaccines in this slide right here, if you look at the top row, that none of them received other vaccines. Thank you very much. That's a good information. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Klein. Uh, we're going to move on now to a vast assessment of GBS after Janssen COVID-19 vaccine with Dr. Lee. Please, Dr. Lee. Uh, thanks so much. I'm happy to be here to present on behalf of uh, Bob Hopkins and myself and the VAST work group. Next slide. Uh, as of yesterday, there are now 339 million doses administered instead of 338 million when I made these slides a few days ago. Um, 187 million individuals with at least one dose. And again, as of yesterday, there are now 162 million people fully vaccinated in the US. As we all know, there's significant variability in vaccination rates by state and by community. Um, this graphic, I really like it because it demonstrates the tremendous benefits of COVID-19 vaccines in reducing death rates in states and communities that are highly vaccinated. It also demonstrates the tremendous opportunities we have to continue to protect ourselves, our families, and our communities against COVID-19 morbidity and mortality. Next slide. Um, today, we focused on a particular adverse event, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and estimating the potential risks associated with vaccination. The role of VAST is to ensure that we're carefully monitoring vaccine safety and ensuring these risks are communicated to the ACIP and hence to the public in a timely and transparent manner. Uh, this slide uh, shows an estimated rate of about 1 in 70,000, which is the midpoint of current estimates for the risk of GBS. Each of the green squares is a person or individual who is vaccinated and now protected against COVID-19 disease. And there is one individual, the red square in the right upper uh, quadrant, um, who may have an adverse event following vaccination. And there are 69,999 individuals who receive vaccines and do not have this adverse event. So I just wanted to make a couple of points before moving on. Um, ACIP's responsibility is to ensure that we are providing the best possible recommendations for the U.S. population on the use of COVID-19 vaccines um, and that our assessments about the benefits of vaccination and the risks of vaccination are placed in the context of the dynamic burden of disease that we're experiencing in the U.S., while also recognizing that we're a member of the global community, knowing that infections do not respect borders. As ACIP members, we must acknowledge the importance of these adverse events in individuals. And it's also important for us to acknowledge the immense benefits of vaccination in preventing poor health and economic outcomes for the population. Um, ACIP will continue to mitigate these risks whenever possible in close partnership with our provider and our public health communities. Next slide. Great, thank you. Here's an update on our VAST activities. And oh, no, I'm sorry, the um, uh, formatting uh, got a little bit thrown off, uh, but we've had 28 independent meetings to review vaccine safety data since December 21st, 2020, and six joint meetings with the COVID-19 Vaccines Workgroup to discuss safety issues. And since ACIP's last meeting on June 23rd, VAST shared a workgroup report following our meeting on June 28th. Next slide. At that meeting, we reviewed data from VAERS that demonstrated the observed number of preliminary cases of GBS after Janssen vaccine was greater than expected in those 18 years and older. And this was observed in all age groups, and we did not observe any geographic clustering um, in the VAERS data. 
Uh, at the same time, VAST noted that the observed versus expected reporting rates were not elevated for mRNA vaccines. And in the VSD and the VA rapid cycle analyses presented that day, there were no statistical signals for GBS identified for any COVID-19 vaccine. However, the rate of GBS following the Janssen vaccine was higher than for the mRNA vaccines in the VSD. Next slide. We noted that the GBS cases reported after AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine was elevated, um, uh, which is in the vaccine is used in other countries. And VAST members discussed the need for review and adjudication of various case reports of GBS using Brighton collaboration criteria and ongoing monitoring of GBS among persons who received the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine in the US. Next slide. Following that meeting on July 9th, uh, the European Medicines Agency or the EMA announced the addition of a warning for GBS following the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. And on July 12th, the FDA announced revisions to the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine EUA fact sheets for providers and for patients to include information about an observed increased risk of GBS following vaccination. Next slide. At the VAST meetings on July 12th and July 19th, we reviewed key updates on GBS from the federal safety systems, which was shared today with ACIP by Dr. Alam Tandani and Dr. Klein. Um, as a reminder, GBS is typically thought to occur following a respiratory or gastrointestinal illness, and background rates of GBS generally increase with age and um, is greater in males than in females. In the table, you can see the summary of findings regarding GBS cases per million doses of COVID-19 vaccines administered in VAERS and VSD for those 18 years and over. Following the Janssen vaccine, the rate of GBS ranges from 8 to 20 per million doses in VAERS and the VSD. In contrast, the rate of GBS following mRNA vaccines ranges from 0.7 to 1.1 per million doses in the two systems with an expected background rate of approximately 1.6 cases of GBS expected in the 42-day window per million doses given. Um, I, I should note that um, I didn't annotate this, but the VSD is based on the 21-day risk window. Next slide. VAS discussed these findings and um, felt that the risk for GBS following Janssen COVID-19 vaccines is substantially different than either the risk following mRNA vaccines or expected background rates, with a median onset of 13 days in VAERS and more commonly reported in males and females. Of note, uh, fewer individuals receive Janssen in the US. Um, it represents less than 4% of all vaccine doses administered in the US. And we also note that GBS cases um, have been reported following SARS-CoV-2 infection in the literature with a median onset of 12 to 14 days post-infection. Next slide. VAST discussed the importance of medical record review of various cases in process using Brighton collaboration criteria um, and the need to confirm the diagnosis of GBS and to further characterize the clinical presentation, severity, and outcomes of GBS cases following Janssen vaccine. Um, we also discussed the need to continue to assess benefit-risk balance given the dynamic epidemiology of COVID-19 infection. Next slide. VAST will continue to monitor and support the response to safety data in the U.S. Our safety monitoring systems will continue to track on anaphylaxis and myocarditis following mRNA COVID-19 vaccines and TTS and GBS following Janssen COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, we also continue to monitor the pre-specified adverse events and special interest in each of our federal agencies monitoring safety. Um, and we are appreciative of the communication and the collaboration among our federal agencies responsible for vaccine safety surveillance in the U.S., as well as the communication and collaboration with global partners in monitoring the safety landscape overall. Um, ACIP will continue to incorporate safety um, data into decision-making about vaccine use including ongoing assessments about benefit risk balance that are contextualized to real-time data and risk mitigation strategies that support informed discussions with patients and the public 
about the benefits and risks of available vaccines, as well as clinical guidance to support early detection and appropriate management of potential adverse events. Next slide. I just wanna thank our vast members who continue to volunteer their time to serve on this incredibly demanding work group. I especially wanna recognize um, Bob Hopkins, who is the NVAC chair, and Lori Markowitz and Melinda Wharton for their tremendous leadership of this work group. Um, and our ex officio and liaison reps and the many, many vaccine safety investigators who have worked together with us as a team to support safety surveillance for the country. Thank you. And I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Romero. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for that presentation. Um, so at this point, um, this presentation and all other presentations so, and discussion uh, is now um, uh, going forward. So please, anyone who has any questions from the voting members or comments. Dr. Fry, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lee, for a very nice presentation. I'm sorry if I missed this. Do we know what the uh, rate of or how, how many cases there have been reported uh, due to COVID-19? I'm sorry um, if I missed so that. Uh, there are case reports that are reported in the literature um, of GBS following COVID-19 infection. Um, I think that this is an area of opportunity to better understand what the uh, population level risks are, but that information is not yet available. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Rockwell. Um, thank you. Uh, Dr. Romero, I was just trying to get my hand down because Dr. Fry asked my question. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no need to apologize. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Uh, any liaisons that wish to ask a question? Dr. Paling. Um, okay, thank you for a very nice presentation. Um, I wanted, we're going to be focused on Guillain-Barre, but I do want to um, circle back and make sure when you're evaluating the myocarditis, um, has that remained to be relatively mild and um, uh, resolving quickly, or have there been any changes in that? Um, I mean, um, I don't know if Dr. Shimabukuro is on or somebody from ISO. I'll just say that we continue to um, carefully monitor uh, myocarditis. Um, and I know that uh, many clinicians uh, across uh, all the uh, US hospitals have been collaborating and working together on ensuring that close follow-up of uh, these individuals is being done. Um, I, I would want to invite our ISO colleagues if they're available to just comment on um, the ongoing activities if possible. Hi, this is Tom Shimabukuro. Um, we in the last presentation that we covered myocarditis, we indicated that um, most of the cases um, responded well to conservative or supportive treatment, and um, most, the overwhelming majority, um, had recovered from their symptoms and had been discharged um, from from the hospital, discharged from clinical care, and that general pattern is holding up. Thank you for that uh, comment. So I want, I want to remind everyone uh, that uh, the topic at hand today is the GBS um, uh, issue. And um, there will be a, an update on myocarditis uh, in the near future. Um, and we want to really address the question of GBS today. Um, we'll come back to myocarditis uh, in a future uh, meeting. Um, I'm not trying to stifle discussion, but I want to move forward on this one topic, please. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Dr. Bernstein. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks uh, for a neat presentation. I, I was wondering whether the collaboration globally with, let's say, the EMA, whether they have a liaison that's participating uh, with the vast group, or how is the collaboration uh, globally unfolding? 
This is Dr. Cohn. I can start. Uh, we have uh, a CDC uh, uh, representative uh, who uh, participates and attends uh, both the WHO meetings on Gavi on vaccine safety as well as uh, others uh, with other countries, and she participates in the VAS call. Uh, that's Dr. Rita Helfand. Um, I don't know if uh, Grace or um, anybody else has any comments, but there is a connectivity to the global discussion, um, both directly with CDC and other countries as well as through WHO. Thanks. I, given the, the uh, larger experience with the vaccine outside of the United States, that data is uh, valuable. Thank you for those comments. Dr. Kimberlin. David Kimberlin, AAP Red Book. Uh, help me understand, in the VSD, no statistically significant signal, and yet the comparison between Janssen and the mRNA vaccines um, showed differences in rates. Uh, uh, the lack of a statistical signal in the VSD ha has me a bit confused. Um, I'm, ha I'm happy to comment from the VAST perspective, and I'll also invite Dr. Klein to comment. Um, but uh, we, uh, you know, the number of doses of Janssen vaccine administered in any given system is different than the number of doses administered in the U.S. Uh, more specifically. Um, the, uh, I'll, actually, I'm going <laughs> to ask Dr. Klein to comment, and I can add anything afterwards. Uh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Lee. That was um, pretty much, you said it very well in terms of, we, as a reminder, we have had under 350,000 doses of the Janssen vaccine versus <clears throat> over 11 million doses for the mRNA vaccine. Then GVS is a rare outcome. But um, we are continuing to monitor. And if that situation were to change and the dose numbers were to change substantially, we would certainly continue to monitor for, for statistical signals. But um, you are correct that we have not signaled. Um, but I think that's uh, many has much to do with the number of doses that we of yeah, and just another um, sort of brief comment about um, the the importance of um, this this federal um, agency collaboration is tremendous. Um, you know, VSD has the ability to do both. Many of our active surveillance systems, uh, the VA, CMS, and other systems that have close populations, have the ability to conduct signal investigation activities and signal evaluation activities. So while the signal is coming from the VAERS system, um, the, you know, the opportunity we have with the VSD and particularly with their ability to do these quick reviews and um, really extremely uh, real-time chart reviews, I think complements the overall safety system. So um, in many ways, uh, although each system has its own um, strengths and numbers, I, the benefit of this um, this collaboration, this coordination across federal agencies is that as um, issues or questions arise in one system, we have the opportunity to work with other systems uh, who have different strengths and capabilities to understand more deeply uh, what's going on in a real-time fashion. So I think um, uh, regardless of any individual system, it's the collective that actually makes the difference. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? All right. I'm not seeing any. Um, so thank you all uh, for the presentations and thank you for the questions. Um, so um, we're going to go a little off schedule here and we're going to have uh, Johnson & Johnson slash Janssen um, uh, offer comments uh, and um, we'll turn it over to them. Um, are you all ready? We are. Uh, please go ahead. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Matai Mammon. I, I run R&D at Janssen. So thanks very much for the opportunity to, to talk with you today. Um, we've been busy at work uh, since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, really dedicated to developing a single shot, easily distributed, safe and effective vaccine to help combat the pandemic's effects worldwide. So we are fully aligned with FDA on the addition of information on the cases of Guillain-Barre that have been observed 
uh, following vaccination with uh, the Janssen vaccine. We do have some recently published data on variant coverage and durability of the immune response that we wanted to make sure the committee is aware of to provide additional context for the discussion today. As you're all acutely aware, the pandemic is evolving both in the US and globally. The Delta variant shown here in gray makes up the large majority of COVID-19 cases in the US now. We're just a couple months ago, it's not present at all. So we need vaccines that cover current and future variants that are durable in their protection. Importantly, we're still learning about the duration of protection and the breadth of coverage against this evolving variant landscape for each of the uh, uh, authorized vaccines. In that context, here are some new and evolving data. On the left graph, we have the level of neutralizing antibody titers to different variants following a single dose of the Janssen vaccine measured out to eight months. The antibody titers against the variants continue to rise after day 29, including against Delta. This suggests further maturation of the immune response, and these, these effects are sustained through day 239, or approximately eight months. <clears throat> and you can see there is a comparable response to all variants analyzed by eight months, including, <clears throat> again, the Delta variant. It's critical to understand that there are components to the immune system outside of neutralizing antibodies that play a very important role in preventing infection. First, T cell responses are shown on the right. As reported in recent publications, our vaccine induces very strong CD4 positive and CD8 positive T cell responses. And these two persist through eight months. And as you can see here, they're comparable across variants. It's important to note that the mutations in the virus have not shown up in T-cell epitopes. Therefore, it's not surprising that the T-cells induced by our vaccine are comparably active against all the variants known today. CD8 positive T-cells in particular, shown on the lower right of the slide, are the body's primary mechanism to clear infected cells. Of note, we've also observed this persistence and comparable response to variants for non-neutralizing functional antibodies induced by the vaccine. At this stage, we don't know whether all these immune data and others recently reported are predictive of clinical efficacy, but we do believe that all these components of the immune response are important and they're all persistent. So we will have a better view on clinical efficacy in the coming weeks. Now, I would like to pass to Dr. Joanne Waltstreicher to give a high-level overview of the safety of our, uh, and our view on the benefit-risk profile. Thanks so much, Dr. Mammon. There were 100 cases of Guillain-Barre from VAERS out of the more than 12 million people in the U.S. who have received the Janssen vaccine, giving an overall reporting rate of eight cases per million people vaccinated. This is in the context of the different published rates of GBS in the U.S., which have ranged from one to five cases per million people. To provide further context, next I'll show the risk of GBS in relation to the risk seen with some other vaccines. The estimated risk of GBS reported with the H1N1 vaccine is at approximately three cases per million, while that of the shingles vaccine is five to eight cases per million people vaccinated and thrombosis with thrombocytopenia after the Janssen vaccine is estimated to have a risk of approximately three cases per million people vaccinated. I want to say again that these cases are not just numbers, they are people and they matter deeply to us. We do have some data on the risk of GBS with COVID, one published study and one internal population-based analysis that we can share if the committee would like to see it. The risk of developing Guillain-Barre after COVID is much higher than the risk of any of the than any of the risks presented here. Okay. Okay. That's why it's necessary to consider these risks in the context of the overall benefits of preventing COVID. This slide includes an estimate of the potential benefit over a one-year period in terms of hospitalization and death for 1 million people vaccinated with either the Janssen vaccine or no vaccine in the setting of different levels of transmission. For every 1 million people vaccinated, even in the setting of very low transmission, many hospitalizations and deaths are avoided. 
and these benefits outweigh the risks of GBS and TTS. The overall benefit risks remain favorable even in the very low transmission setting, but particularly so as transmission is higher as seen in various parts of the US and globally. This is especially important as we see this new variant profile emerging, as well as the recent surge in case counts. There is still a need to vaccinate as many people as possible, both in the US and globally. The pandemic continues to evolve in the presence of many who remain unvaccinated, and the variant landscape is changing rapidly and unpredictably. Multiple vaccine options are needed in the global public health toolbox. In this context, the Janssen vaccine offers important benefits. Newly published data that Dr. Mammon just shared demonstrate persistent humoral and cellular immune responses through eight months, independent of variants. And as a single dose with simple storage conditions, the vaccine has particular public health benefits in the US and globally. And this global context is critical. As mobility resumes and variants continue to emerge, there is no question that the U.S. population will remain vulnerable so long as large segments of the globe remain unvaccinated. And for many parts of the globe, the single dose and easily transportable vaccine is critical. Finally, we agree with the FDA statement that the known and potential benefits clearly outweigh the known and potential risks. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Uh, they're greatly appreciated. So next, um, we're going to move forward with um, the public comment. Um, do we have our speakers at this time? Not yet. Um, it seems that we're going to wait a little bit longer. So um, we will take public comment at the top of the hour. Thank you very much.